it's undeniable that we're undergoing an electric vehicle revolution and over half the cars on the road in 2040 will be EVs. Not to mention, it's clear that the carbon footprint from owning an EV will be internal combustion engine vehicles any day. And the total cost of ownership with EVs is getting really close to the car that wholeheartedly represents my culture, the Toyota Camry. I cannot wait till the day that I can tell my dad that owning a Tesla is cheaper, better, and more efficient than the Toyota Camry. It can drive itself as well, so you can argue with my uncles and aunties about real estate all you want with no hands. So in this video, let's talk about renewable energy, but more specifically, the lithium in the global battery supply chain for electric vehicles. Don't worry, there will be an electric vehicle video after this one. And of course, this video is not financial advice or recommendation to do anything. It's just general information for entertainment purposes. In saying that, if you do learn something new, consider gently smashing that like button right there or leave a comment with your key takeaways so that we can all learn together. So without further ado, let's go. First, let me paint the backdrop. There are five main parts to the global battery supply chain. Six if you include battery recycling. And everything starts with mining the key materials like lithium, nickel, and cobalt from the ground. Then these raw materials will be processed for anode and cathode production, which will then be sent to battery manufacturers to turn into battery cells, which will then be implemented into electric vehicles. Just to clarify, within a lithium ion battery, there is the positive electrode, which is the cathode, and the negative electrode, which is the anode. Now, the overview of the battery supply chain just now is incredibly simplified. In reality, there are a lot of logistical challenges, geopolitical issues, and ESG concerns. But for our sanity's sake, we are going to zoom in on the lithium part. There are two main ways to produce lithium currently. You can either mine the hard rocks out and go through a conversion process to produce lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. Now, the hard rocks are also known as spodumene. The other method is to pump a lithium-rich brine onto the surface, almost like a pond, and then you let Mother Nature do its thing evaporating the water content and the salt then can be converted into lithium carbonate. And if you do want lithium hydroxide, you will have to take an extra step, process it into lithium hydroxide. The main difference between lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide is mainly their utility and their cost. Carbonate tends to be cheaper to produce and more commonly used in Audi and Porsche's NCM622 cathode chemistry. By the way, NCM622 basically just means there are six parts of nickel, two parts of cobalt, and two parts of manganese in the cathode. Because of the geopolitical challenges of mining cobalt in Congo, the battery industry and the automakers are trying to move away from using cobalt with a higher nickel chemistry. And with a higher nickel chemistry, that requires lithium hydroxide. That's a really important tailwind, so please keep that in mind for the rest of this video. Now you shouldn't be surprised that the automakers have committed more than 300 billion US dollars in electrification over the next few years. And the implied lithium demand is huge because of that. The problem is low lithium prices have created a situation where lithium producers are not making enough margin to reinvest into expansion facilities or even new assets. And because it takes a long time for the lithium projects to come online, this is increasing the probability of lithium producers not being able to meet the demand of automakers in the future. Wait, there is more. The pandemic have exacerbated the reliance on China for lithium, and that have sparked conversations of localizing the battery supply chain in the respective continents. Not to mention, because of the automakers' commitment towards carbon emissions in the future, there are expectations for the supply chain to also follow that sustainability practice. Based on all that background information, we know that one, future EV demand is high, but low lithium prices might have hurt the capacity expansion efforts, which will impact future supply. Two, if the automakers want to achieve the EV targets, they will be scrambling to lock in supply in the very near future, just so that they're not exposed to any supply or pricing issues. Tesla locking in a five-year contract with Pitmon Lithium is a really good example of that. Three, because of China's dominance in the battery supply chain, there's an increased interest in lithium projects within the respective continents to localize the battery supply chain. And using everything I went through so far, I created a simple framework to help me filter out 
lithium projects that's worth researching more into. So there are four main components to the framework. Is the lithium project in a high EV growth continent? Is the continent politically stable? Is the project spodumene or brine? I am personally looking for spodumene hard rock projects just because there is a faster time to market and it's flexible enough to go either lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. And finally, how long does it take for the project to come online? High EV growth continents are generally areas where government policies are heavily favoring EV adoption and trying to end internal combustion engine vehicle sales. The most aggressive are Norway, Netherlands, Germany, UK and France. They are trying to end internal combustion engine vehicle sales between 2030 and 2040. Not to mention Commissioner Breton's opening address for the EU Raw Materials Alliance stated that they want to leverage the lithium resource in EU so that by 2025, they will be almost self-sufficient in lithium for their batteries. So EU is where I started my research rabbit hole and it's more politically stable compared to projects in developing countries. It took me a few days to sift through the lithium projects on the ASX that at least fulfilled the first two criteria. Before we go further, I just want to remind you that this video is not financial advice. It's just publicly available information for entertainment purposes and I'm not sponsored to make this video. But feel free to tap that like button if you have learned something new. This is what I found. The turquoise colored countries means that there are gigafactories committed or planned there. And the yellow colored countries represents where the lithium projects are. There are three lithium projects I found on the ASX that fulfills my criteria and it just so happened that they're really close to the gigafactories planned or committed in Europe. By now, many of you would have heard about the European Metals Holdings since the EV Stock Channel have created a video on that. So if you haven't seen that video, highly recommend you to go check that video out. In short, European Metals Holdings have a 49% ownership in one of the largest lithium hard rock projects in Europe. And this project is located in Czechia. Now this project is 51% owned by a state-owned entity while receiving assistance from EIT Inno Energy, which is a principal facilitator to the European Battery Alliance. And because this lithium project is in Czechia, they are literally sandwiched by gigafactories across Europe. Again, I just wanna remind you that I am personally looking for hard rock projects because they have the flexibility to produce lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. And at the same time, hard rock projects tend to have a shorter time to market compared to a brine project. On top of that, this project is very crucial to the European battery supply chain. So this is definitely on my watch list to study some more. Infinity Lithium owns the second largest hard rock project in Europe. And that project is based in Spain, which is a little bit further away from the gigafactories. At the same time, they are currently funded by EU's EIT Inno Energy for up to 800,000 euros to build their pilot plant to start sending samples for testing and validation. It currently costs Infinity Lithium approximately 5,400 US dollars to produce one ton of lithium hydroxide. So it's definitely a little bit higher than European metals, but overall it's still on the lower end of the cost curve. Vulcan Energy Resources is the last lithium project in Europe that have caught my attention. This is actually a brine project, which means that the lithium rich brine will need to be pumped to the surface to extract the lithium. But the interesting twist is that they are using the steam and heat from the lithium rich brine to generate renewable electricity, which can be used to power the facility or sold back to the grid. Then once the brine is extracted, they will re-inject that liquid back into the reservoir. The lowest cost of producing lithium hydroxide using the brine method is between five to $7,000 per ton. So definitely a higher cost per ton between the three projects that I'm studying. On top of that, because this is a brine and also a geothermal project, it's very likely that it's gonna take longer than a lot of the hard rock projects to come online. But nonetheless, because they're using the cleanest form of renewable energy and also two revenue streams of either selling energy that's being produced or the lithium, I personally thought it would be really interesting to keep it on my watch list to study some more. Now I know some of you will be really disappointed that I didn't talk about lithium projects in Australia, but the truth is a lot of the lithium that we produce gets shipped to China or sold to some of the biggest Chinese lithium producers. So I wanted to explore a different path and also look at some of the critical pieces for a continent's future battery supply chain. But I would love to get some feedback on how I've thought about the lithium projects and whether I am being overly optimistic 
or I'm not cautious enough with some of these projects. So talk to me in the comment section below. Just a quick portfolio update. As of recording this video, my CMC market portfolio side of things is currently worth 68,293 bucks. And I haven't bought anything, I haven't sold anything. So if I do make any changes here, I'll make sure to keep you posted in my future videos. Now, there are two main questions that I keep getting over and over again. First question is, what is this tool I am using to track my portfolio? And this tool is called ShareSite. Now I'm not sponsored by them, but I just prefer to track my portfolio here other than spreadsheets or even use the CMC market platform just because the dashboarding is very ugly and it doesn't really tell you the dividends and the capital gains. So that's pretty handy. The second question is, how am I able to grow my portfolio so quickly over the last couple of months? And to tell you the truth, I try to live as simply as I possibly can be without taking a lot of the fun out of life and I invest majority of my income into my portfolio. That's it. I don't have a secret formula. There's no magic to it. There is just consistent hard work and just keep increasing my income. That's it. That's all I have to say. With my stake portfolio, it's currently worth about 25 thousand us dollars so that's give or take approximately 31 to 32 thousand australian dollars and this portfolio have grown really quickly mainly because of two main things with my tesla shares at by now you should know that tesla is entering into s p 500 and ever since then the share price have just run really hot and have gone up substantially i don't really know how sustainable that is but i'm not complaining either and the other thing is there was a piece of news of Salesforce potentially buying out Slack. And ever since that piece of news went public, their share price have essentially gone way, way up. And I don't think that's sustainable. And I didn't buy into this company because I anticipated that Salesforce will buy out Slack. I genuinely think that Slack have a really great product. And if the deal doesn't pan out the way Salesforce or the public expects it to be, then I do think the share price would kind of come back down to earth. The one last thing is Dropbox GoPro, not part of my portfolio, but they are free stocks that's given to me if you do try steak for yourself. Now I'm not sponsored by steak, but if you do want to try steak for yourself, I'll leave a link in the description box below. So thank you so much for watching this video all the way to the end. If you have learned something new and want to be part of my fortnightly Q&A, not to mention some additional content pieces, consider supporting this channel via Patreon. Nevertheless, it already means the world to me you've watched this far. So if you're in the mood for more videos, I have left something on the screen that I think you'll really enjoy. Until next time, my name is David. Otto will always do the honors and see you very, very soon.